important. Uh, so I'm going to cut straight to so much to, to you uh, for the invitation. It is a great pleasure to be here. Um, well, uh, let me introduce myself. I am Peruvian. I work in genetics uh, right now. I did my PhD in, in Brazil in working with Eduardo Tarasino Santos. In, uh, in the, uh, and right now I am working for in the O'Connor Group in Maryland. And I keep working on Native American ancestry because it's one of the, the topics that I, I think that is very exciting. So uh, if I can start, just let me know. You bet. Go right ahead. <laughs> OK, so today's talk is, is called uh, How Did I Get There? Genetic History of Native Americans in Central Andes. And for this talk, I will present some results of the lab and also results of other lab in, in, in the way of uh, trying to integrate to get some insights about the history of this Native American group. So first of all, uh, to get some insights about history, we, uh, we will not try to, under, to, understand, to, to understand just genetics observations, but also we have to join this information with archaeology and also linguistic and see which is the main pattern that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that we can get to see, uh, to get deep in the history of, of group, not only Andean groups, but also human populations and how uh, <clears throat> factors like geography, demography, and also culture can shape all these three different patterns and see what, it, what they have in common. <clears throat> to start, um, I have uh, drawn in two questions. The first is maybe the most simple to answer, which is where we are, where we are in a, geogra in a geographical point of view. And the other one is uh, how people interact with, with each other and with the environment. Well, let's start for where we are. And <clears throat> in this case, when I talk of where we are, we are talking of the Central Andean region. And when we say Central Andean region, we are not referring just to the highlands, but also to the Pacific coast and the Amazon lowlands. <clears throat> and this, and basically this, three biogeographical regions has, has different, have different uh, features. For example, the Peruvian coast is basically a desert and a narrow desert uh, along the Pacific, the, the Pacific Ocean. And on the other hand, we have the, the Andean mountain chain, which basically represent um, a challenge to the settlement represented a challenge a challenge for the settlement of the first uh, first Andean people. And moreover, we have the Amazon rainforest, which is uh, a set of highly heterogeneous forests that uh, that expand along the Amazon basin. And between these three different biogeographical regions, we have transition regions. For example. Uh, a cloudy forest called it Amazon Junga or Montaña that, uh, that it, it, it is between the high, uh, <clears throat> the Andean mountain chain and the Amazon uh, lowlands. And going back to the Andean region, we can see that this is not an homogeneous biogeographical region. It, they, they, this region has a particularity, particularity that is diff, uh, the altitude is heterogeneous along South America. And specifically, if we see, if we see uh, a region called Huancabamba repression in northern Peru, in southern, southern Ecuador and northern Peru, we can see that this, this, this region corresponds to the northwest and also the lower, uh, at the same, the lowest point of the Amazon of the Andean mountain chain, as you can see on the plot on the on the left, there is <clears throat> uh, the, the lowest point is is exactly in, in which this uh, red arrow is pointing out. <clears throat> and this Central Andean region was the main scenario for the development of state level societies, and archaeologists have. Uh, have elaborated a chronology 
for this for the Andean history. And the main characteristic of this chronology is that it's divided in two types of periods, the periods of cultural unity and periods of regional development. <clears throat> so let's start with the with the periods of cultural unity. When we said that there is a, a period of cultural unity, we are referring to the expansion of and the, uh, and the high influence of uh, a specific cultural group. In, in the case of the Andes, there are three periods of this expansion, also called it horizon, which are Chavín, Huari uh, Tiahuanaco, uh, and Inca, and are, and, and are directly related to empires or, or cultural groups. From the going to the the most ancient of this horizon, <clears throat> it is the early horizon the, that is represented by the Chavin culture that started three three thousand years ago, and this culture is characterized to because it shows some evidence of cultural interaction with the Amazon, and expand its influence to part of the Central Andes and also to the coast region. After this, after the falling of this uh, this culture, started a period of regional development called the early intermediate. This early intermediate correspond to uh, the development of small groups, uh, cultural groups that end with the with the beginning or the rise or two empires, two main empires. Uh, in, the, in the Andean region, call it the Wari and Tiahuanaco. Wari that was predominant in Peru, and Tiahuanaco in, Boli in, in Bolivia, and um, in part of, of Bolivia and Chile, and it started in the year 500 to uh, and then um, 1,000 years ago. After the, uh, and why is this? And along this, uh, along this talk, I will mention it, this a specific period because. It has. It is important because <clears throat> it, 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 linguistic set have suggest that the main distribution, the, the current distribution of some of the predominant language families like Quechua and Aymara, maybe start in in this period. By the falling of these uh, two empires, started another transition period, which was in, in, which is called the late intermediate, with the development of regional cultures, and finally the most popular uh, of the horizons, which is the the Inca the, the Inca uh, in which was characterized by the presence of the Inca Empire, and that is very recently re recent, almost six hundred years uh, years ago. And just to summarize that, <clears throat> to, to, uh, to have a big picture of the archeological history, uh, I'm sorry, of the, the, the chronology of the Andean history, we can see that we have periods of cultural unity and between these periods, we have this regional development. And how all this, the, the, how the history and geography have uh, influenced other patterns. So, if we observe the current distribution of linguistic families, we can observe, we can see that in the case of the Andean region, as I, I am pointed out, there there is um, there is just one super group of linguistic families called Quechua Maran that includes the Quechua and Aymara languages. But on the other hand, on the Amazon we observe a very different pattern with highly, uh, with a huge number of linguistic families in which the, the most, uh, the, the not, not the most important, but the most, uh, that have a, a huge distribution are the Tupian, Arawakan, Carib, and Panuan. And specifically the Arawakan that has one of the, the greatest distribution that expands from the Caribbean, region to the eastern slope of, of the Andes. So it is suggested that since considering the, uh, the different level of expansion 
and also the diversity of the linguistic family that maybe uh, linguistic families in the Amazon have uh, an older history comparing with the Andean. And let's go to genetics, which is the main topic of this, of this talk. So <clears throat> to get some insights about the Andean history, I will explain most, most of the results that were inferred by analyzing the variation across the genome. Okay, and how we can get this information through, gene through DNA sequencing. And before sequencing, we start a, a, ver a very complicated but awesome process, which is the, the sampling of the, of the individuals. And as an example, I would like to talk about the Peruvian Genome Project, which was an initiative of the Peruvian National Institute of Health, founded, funded by the, the Ministry of Health of the Peruvian government, and which main goal was to understand the genetic makeup of admixed and Native Americans in Peru. This project started, if I'm right, in 2011 with a collaboration of the Peruvian National Institute of, of Health with two other institutions, one in Brazil and the other in Maryland, which is the University of Maryland, and in Brazil is the Federal University, uh, Federal University of Minas Gerais, in which I did my PhD. <clears throat> so along this project, if I, uh, the sampling take almost four years in, in get the, the, the blood samples for different populations from, uh, from admixed and Native American groups. And as part of the, of the process of this process of sampling, of sampling all, all this all the start with, uh, with talking with communities and informing which will, will be the goals of this project. And I, I think almost all, all people of this communities show a highly interest in, in to know which is the, the genetic composition or the history of, of their group. And the, the Peruvian Institute of Health has uh, presented to, this, uh, to these communities the, the long-term benefits of this type of studies and also performed some uh, analysis of the, of the health status of each of the individuals that participated in, in the project. And this health, uh, health status was <clears throat> determined by uh, some blood tests or other biochemical tests. So without these samples, we can get this, all these, these wonderful results. So <clears throat> after that, after we got, we, after half, these samples and after sequencing and the sequencing was performed in Peru and also in the US, we start to, by performing some statistical analysis that can give us some insights into the history and which type of analysis we can, we can perform. First, we can perform some analysis called population clustering in which we can get some ideas of the genetic affinity between individuals. We can also perform tests uh, related to the gene, to gene flow analysis to see, okay, if we have two different populations, how, how frequently they, sh they, 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 sh they share some, some genes. Then we, we can estimate the diverg diverg divergence times in which, okay, you, we have another, uh, uh, again, we have these two populations and how much in time we, uh, they were ind uh, independently, uh, as an independent, uh, independent entities. And to see uh, how deep in time there was just a common recent ancestor for both populations. And finally, uh, by, by accompanying a natural, by accompanying the, the physiological characteristics of a population, we can analyze and seek for signals of natural selection along the genome to explain and to understand which is the genetic, the genetic architecture of some of the main features that explain adaptation to any environment, for example, the, the highland Andes. 
So going back to the network of ideas, the, yeah, uh, we, we now have a, a, an answer for where we are in terms of archaeology, geography, and linguistics. And now let's see what we can get from genetics to answer the second question, which is how people interact with each other and with the environment. <clears throat> and starting with genetic history, I would like to start with uh, a work that was made by my uh, former PhD, uh, my PhD advisor, Eduardo Tarazona Santos, that was published in 2001. And by analyzing the chromosome Y, uh, they, they show it that they, they create, they, pro they propose a model of evolution, a demographic model for Western and Eastern population and show it that these two groups have uh, different patterns, di di different evolutionary patterns. For example, as you can see on this cartoon, population from Western, uh, Western South America, basically Andean population, they show uh, higher values of effective population size and also higher values of gene flow among them. So we, we are saying that there is, there is a, a huge amount of move, uh, people movement between these populations. That is contrast with the model proposed for the Easter population, in which, uh, <clears throat> in which uh, Easter population are, are shown like a, uh, like family family groups, in which they share just they, they have a small values of effective population size and also a small uh, and, a, and a small rate of gene flow among them. So. As a, as, as a first result of the Peruvian Genome Project, Daniel Harris in 2018 proposed that these two, based on this model, that divergence between, between these two regions was at least 12,000 years ago. So this idea, create, uh, these results create an idea of an Andean and Amazon divide, like two independent regions that are evolving independently from each other. But first, the first question, is this Amazon divide real? So in the, 2000, uh, in the 2020, we have published, uh, we, last year we have published uh, an article in PNIS in which we have uh, increased our samples with including population from Northern Peru to determine if we can see along, along Peru, if there is the same pattern of differentiation. And on the right, you can see a principal component analysis in which the idea of a principal component analysis on, gen on, on genetic data is to see the genetic affinity between two individuals. And each individual in this plot is represented by a point. So on the left corner of this plot, we can observe that Andean populations, basically these brown points on the map, uh, they are clearly differentiated from Arawak Amazon populations on the, uh, on the eastern region of the Andes, which uh, I am pointing in, in the map. <clears throat> so if we are observing just the southern region of Peru, we can say that, okay, there, there exist, this Andes Amazon divide exists. But what about the north? In the north, there is a totally different different pattern in which we can see that population on, on the north, uh, for example, population from the coast and Andean, and also lowlands population from the Amazon, they are very they are close related. And let's remember that at the beginning, when I was explaining about the geography of this region, it was uh, I mentioned it that. In this region, we can find the lowest and narrowest point of the Andes. So we can see that geography is uh, favorizing the affinity between these two populations. Chiara Barbieri, uh, before us, Chiara Barbieri has shown that a specific uh, that population from northern Peru 
including population from the coast and population from the, no from the highlands, they show a clearly different pattern comparing with the southern Andean populations. But we are extending uh, the results that not only the north and the Andean and the coast, but also some other Amazon population. And this concept, it is not new for other fields like archaeology, in which they, they, uh, there are some archaeological evidence of contact, of trade, of commercial trade in northern Peru, contrasting with the south region. So, um, with archaeological archaeological data, we can say that okay, there is a uh, flow of there, there is an interchange of ideas. But now we can say that this flow of ideas was accompanied by human movement. The David Rich group have made a wonderful job by analyzing the uh, the ancient samples. Of, of several time frames in the uh, in the Andes, and they have one of the of their results was a clear a clearly signal of gene flow of contact between populations from the northern Amazon, one population from the northern Amazon, and the and the coast, and they date this uh, this event almost two uh, two thousand years ago. So. Uh, since uh, these uh, results indicate the relationship between ancient populations and we have data from present day population, we test the same hypothesis to try to see and to identify the proportion of the contribution from population from the coast into the Amazon. And what we observe in this point, it, has, it is very difficult. There is gene flow between these populations, but it's it's very difficult, it's very hard to, to identify which was the predominant uh, direction of the gene flow, because we also observe gene flow from the Amazon into the coast. And one of, the, uh, of our hypotheses uh, showed that the gene flow from the coast with this blue arrow into the Amazon uh, involved a, a contribution of more of 61% of uh, of of Pacific Coast contribution into the Amazon, and this was observed not just for one population but for the complete block of of populations that live in that re that that region that we have sampled that we have in the, uh, as part of the Peruvian Genome Project, and this is also observed at the archaeological. Uh, with archaeological evidence, since in the last 2,000 years, there was um, some interactions between people that speak uh, Hibaron language into the coast, into, into the north coast of, coast of Peru, and also with the southern Ecuador. Okay, since we have a, a, an, an idea of that this Andes Amazon divide doesn't this division doesn't reach to the north. Let's see now to the south what we can see and what what are the relationship of these Andean groups uh, in the south. In in this cartoon, what we can what we are observing is a genetic clustering analysis in which we are trying to identify the genetic composition of each individual based on how many ancestral clusters can explain it. So each color of these bar plots represent an, ancest an, ancestry, an ancestral cluster of a, an, uh, an ancestry cluster. So what we observe specifically, specifically for, for the population of, of the, southern, uh, the, the, the South Andes is that, is that all these populations share the same ancestry cluster. And also, on, considering the model of Tarasuna Santos, there is a huge amount of gene flow among them. So we can say that this region, at least, is very homogeneous. So there is an Andean homogenization at this region that says that these populations are more similar among them compared to the other, other biogeographical regions. So when it started, when this homogenization started, to answer this question, I would like to introduce uh, one analysis that we have performed 
for the article that we have published last year, which is an ABD approach. And for this approach, <clears throat> we try to identify uh, segments that two individuals share, and this segment is related to that common, uh, common recent ancestor. So, uh, considering that the amount of IBD segments that two individuals share compared to other individuals, we can say that these two individuals are more common, have more in common in the recent time compared with, compared with the, a third individual. And not only that, if we analyze the size of each of the segments, we can also correlate that larger segments, larger IBD segments, are explain a most recent common ancestor compared to the small segments that will explain ancient relationships. So if we organize, if we infer the IBD, the, in the, the, the IBD identical by descent segments in all these populations and organize in, a small, in subsets re related to the size, we can get some insights about the, the relationships that each of these populations have in a specific period. So what we did is, is that we organized all of these IBD segments in, subset, in three subsets. The larger segments were organized uh, to explain the colonial times and to the present. The small segments were organized to explain the pre-Inca times and the medium segments were organized to explain the Inca Empire time. So what we observe in these heat maps is that the intensity will explain the amount of relationship. Is if it's more intense, we can observe a red color. And on the left of each of these heat maps, we can observe blocks of color like blue, the brown, and the and the green. Each of one represented a specific uh, biogeographical region. The blue will represent the coast, the the brown, the Andes, and the green represent the Amazon. And if, if we're going from the present to the past, we are observing that, okay, we have some high level of, of genetic affinity between the Andean populations at the present that is uh, slightly different in the Inca Empire. But when we go in the pre-Inca times, we are observing that they are very homogeneous, more homogeneous. So with these results, we can say that uh, <coughs> If that it is possible that this Andean homogenization started during this period, and during this period we can refer to what we mentioned at the beginning, uh, a period called the Tiahuanaco Wari, which was during the Middle Horizon, that is more or less in the in the year 500 to 1000, but not only to the Middle Horizon, but maybe also with the, with the falling of this empire. Okay, let's, let's see other relationships of Andean population. Now that we, we have, we have a, an idea that the homogenization started in the Middle Horizon, <clears throat> we can try to see some correlation between genetics and linguistics. And don't do that. Don't try to do a correlation between linguistic and genetics because linguistic is highly dynamic. People that are speaking language, uh, one language today maybe will speak another language uh, tomorrow, I don't know. But it's highly dynamic and in this case, in I will just show some examples in which we have that in the Peruvian Genome Project, we have populations that speak Aymara like the Hakarus in, in Lima, and populations in the south that also speak Aymara, like the Uros or Aymaras from Puno. But uh, <clears throat> specifically, the population, the, this population from called Uros currently speak Aymara, but a uh, linguistic said that in the past they speak another very different language called Pukina that could be uh, that maybe people from the Tiahuanaco Empire, more than 1,000 years ago, uh, expand this language in, into Northern Bolivia. 
And we performed some haplotype-based analysis just to see, again, the genetic affinity between, between this population. And what we observe is that population, the, the popula the, this population, Hakarus, that speak uh, one Aymara language, has more genetic affinity with other Quechua speakers. So we have this interesting uh, picture in which also the po population from Southern uh, Peru in the Titicaca Basin, they speak a very uh, they, they have a very a very different pattern of ancestry that is contrasting with uh, with other Aymara speakers or Quechua speakers in the region of the Andes. So how to explain this highly differentiation of the of this Uro population? Well, <laughs> using oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so. Using ancient genomic data from Nakatsuka et al. 2020, from the David Rage David group, um, we performed some genetic analysis, and this is a, a new result that we, have, we are preparing. Uh, we compared the genetic affinity of each of our present-day samples compared to the ancient samples, and what we see is the Quechua speakers and also uh, Hakarus that speak Aima, uh, I, one Aymara language, they have more genetic affinity with uh, ancient samples related to Wari. In this case, this uh, to 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 the Wari Empire. In this case, these yellow points. And tracing this by like tracing this sample, this sample uh, correspond to uh, uh, to a period a period in 1,000 years ago. And when we, when we see the population from the Titicaca Basin, we observe that they are close related to samples related to the Tiahuanaco, to the Tiahuanaco Empire. So it, uh, we, we have almost the same conclusion that Nakatsuka, that there is some genetic continuity in, along the Andes. So people that live today, they have received some contribution from Andean populations. So we we tried we, we try to get more deep on this signal of relationship, and as we can see in these maps, in, in the uh, above we can observe the what we what, what it is the, the genetic affinity between all our populations or or present day populations with this this green point this green triangle that correspond to ancient samples related to Wari. Let's remember that Wari and Tiagonaco, they belong to the same period. And below, we have uh, the, the same comparison, but in this case, with ancient population related to Tiagonaco. So we have above Wari, and below we have Tiagonaco. And we observe the same pattern uh, as what that I described in the, in the later slide, that populations that live in central Andes, they show, they, they show uh, a higher intensity related to genetic affinity with ancient samples of the central Andes region and the corresponding to the samples from the south. So we try to modulate the, the genetic composition of these individuals from the south and from the north and from, from the central Andes and from the south region, or which correspond to the Titicaca Basin, to see if the uh, how how much time they diverged and they get, and they started as independent population and by there there was no way to get this population from the Titicaca basin as independent populations the, we can just model we can one hypothesis that we have test is that we can only modelate these populations as an admixture as the result of an admixture these Uros and Aymara speakers of the Titicaca Basin can be modeled as the, uh, the admixture almost 50-50% of Southern Central Andes, mainly population that speak Quechua, with Tiahuanaco-related samples. Our next uh, goal is to try to identify when this happened. But for now, this was surprising for, for us. And Maybe we can say we can uh, say that 
In that time, this region corresponds to an interaction sphere, but uh, it, I think that that is, is, is too risky to, to have this conclusion, but we, can, we, we keep working on that. And just get into a, a new, starting with a, 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 another perspective of the genetic history or, the, or explaining the genetic composition of these Native Americans, we have some native, uh, natural selection results in which we perform a scan, uh, we, we perform a search along the genome to, to identify regions that are specifically different and they cannot be explained by, by chance. So in this case, for, to identify some natural selections or signals related to adaptation in some Native American population, we focus on these Southern Andean groups again, and we search for these highly differentiated uh, regions that are particular of this population and not differentiated in other populations like Amazon and East Asia. And what we found are two signals related to uh, one to the Hantu AS uh, gene and the other is to the Duox2. And it results very difficult to explain how these, um, these two signals can, can be related with the, with the adaptation to high altitude. In the case of the first, which is the HAN2, we can try to explain, uh, in the, uh, uh, if we try to relate with the cardiovascular features, because there, there are another works in, there are another articles in which it was described that maybe the pathway to the adaptation in Andean populations has some cardiovascular relation. But in the case of Duox, is it results more obscure to identify uh, what is going on, how to explain how, how this, uh, differenti uh, this gene, this differentiation explains the, the adaptation, but it may be just uh, that we need to improve our, our statistical comparisons to see that maybe we can find another genes and to get a better view of the real pathway in which the adaptation is involved in these populations. And before ending this presentation, I would like to present some conclusions that, uh, as we discussed at the beginning, uh, it is not a clear Andes-Amazon divide, even if, if we can see that geographically there are some differences, but people from these regions, uh, as we observe, from archaeology to genetics, they, sh they, they share some ideas and also they share genes. They are in constant contact. So maybe, as uh, in the second conclusion, we can talk about some spheres of development in the north contrasting with the south in terms of cultural interactions. And also that the Middle Horizon 1,000 years ago could shape the current Andean ancestry distribution, as we see in the examples of the Quechua and some Aymara speakers. The distribution of the populations, not exactly with the linguistic groups that are highly dynamic. Then that differentiation in several losses could, could be the result, the differentiation in this loss could be the result of the the environmental pressure, like the high altitude, high altitude in these Andean groups. And that it is necessary that these interpretations, to, to have a uh, better interpretation in the light of archaeology, linguistic geography, and also genetics. And before to end the presentation, I would like to mention some of the main collaborators, the main uh, participants of, of this project in which first we, ha we have to I have to, uh, to thank to all Native American all Native American population that have participated and, and also for showing that interest to to see which are the relationship between all these populations to all the people of the Peruvian National Institute of Health Omar Cáceres, Marco Galarza, Cesar Sanchez, 
Carlos Padilla and several people that I am forgetting the name, I'm sorry, and to the three major, uh, the, the three principal investigators that participate, my, my current boss, which is Tim O'Connor, my former, uh, and my former advisors, which, is, which are Heiner Gio and also Eduardo Tarasuna Santos. And for now, and thank you so much to you to be part of this webinar. And thank you so much. That was a very excellent talk, Victor. Thank you. It was really interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so to any of our um, audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to throw them up in the Q&A and I will ask them of Dr. Borda. Um, to get the ball rolling while everyone types, um, when you showed your heat maps, uh, I noticed no, in, in uh, uh, the bottom right, there was a consistently high relation area. Yeah, mm -hmm. you see in the, in, right in the bottom there. Um, is there any reason for that? Is there anything that stood out as to why that one stayed consistently associated instead of the rest where it seems to have homogenized a bit? Ah, okay, you're referring to this, this corner, right? Yeah, well, in that case, this, uh, this part of the heat map correspond to populations that, well, two of them, these two, uh, it is difficult to see, but these two correspond to the same uh, tribe. I mean, populations that live in different uh, locations, separated just a few kilometers, but they are the same, uh, considering the same tribe, the Matsigengas. And okay. the other, yeah, and the other is the Asian Inca, which belong to the same linguistic group. So it, it makes sense that to observe this huge amount of sharing between these groups. Okay, that does make sense. Yep. Um, speaking of the linguistics, uh, you mentioned not to try and link genetics to linguistics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to ask, how how out there were some of the the results that you saw when you tried? Yeah. Well. I, it is it is confusing to to start uh, to in performing this correlation. Uh, well, the the good part of, of working with these and, they, and their groups is that since they are just apparently two major linguistic groups, the, the correlation could be more easy to 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 do in case of the key trust, the, the key trust speakers, but. Uh, but I, I mentioned that it's confusing because there are some Amazon populations in the north that speak Quechua and other Colombia population that also speak Quechua. So it's confusing. So it, 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 I recommend to be highly careful to in, in do this type of comparisons. Fair. Right. Uh, do we have anything from the audience? Um, it does not appear so. Uh, all right, I'm going to ask another one then. <clears throat> um, in several of the other uh, Indigenous Voices uh, presentations, they've talked about getting um, information from um, Indigenous populations and how, especially in more modern, uh, more recent times, there's there's developing some pushback against that. Um, did you run into any, any resistance on that one? Um, Generally, it seems that the pushback usually comes in America, in North America, uh, when they're trying to, when you have usually um, European <laughs> descended scientists who are coming into the populations to try and get that. It seemed like you had a lot more cooperation. Yeah, yeah, and the experience with the Peruvian Genome Project is that it it, it was started by the Peruvian government, so uh, it was the people from Lima, for the capital, that they. they Go to the to this. They, they went to these communities, and they always said said the same that people want to to know the, the, their history. You know, they, they want to participate in the in the project, and they also call to their, their, all the community, the family, but um, in order to get a, a good analysis for for this test, we have to exclude familiar groups. So uh, participants, we have a lot. <laughs> But we have some restrictions for the, for the analysis. Excellent. Um, if you had any advice for someone who is trying to, to do research like this um, as the outsider, what would you recommend? What, what would be your best suggestion for maintaining a, 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 an appropriate level of trust between those who are providing the data and those who are doing the analysis? Well, that, that's a very interesting question. I think that the, the first thing that I would recommend is to try to learn some of the, uh, about the history of that group. 
because I, I think that people, if, if you talk with, with Native Americans, some Native American group, and, and you show that you know part of the history, or if you talk in the, in the same language, they will show more trust in you that if you just uh, came to the, to, to, the, to the local and just tried to say, oh, I need your blood to do some sophisticated analysis that you will not understand, something like that. 